Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Writers Chat. And this is where writers like to gather and we talk about writing, all things writers, by writers, and for writers. So we're really, really glad to see you all here. We got a lot of our regular crew coming on or in the chat, and we're excited about today's uh, topic. It's something we all always kind of need to sharpen the, the sword on to learn more about, you know. On, the, on that. So my name's Jean Wise. I'm the, one of the co-hosts here and I'm joined today by Johnny. We haven't seen Johnny the last couple of weeks so we're really excited about having Johnny back. And we've got Melissa. We asked Melissa to stay on for a little bit today because uh, she's going to introduce our special guest and who's going to do a presentation for us and we'll take questions at the end. So Melissa, I'll turn it over to you to introduce Lisa. Thank you, Jean. I I'm honored to get the chance to introduce to you today our multi-published Daphne and Carol Award-winning author, Lisa Carter. She's going to be talking with us about finding your writer's voice, and we're so excited. Um, some of you, I know, like myself, had the privilege of attending some of Lisa's um, classes online this year at the Kentucky Christian Writers Conference, and that was just a phenomenal experience. We learned so much, and Lisa is so gifted at teaching. So I'm, you're in for a treat today. Um, I just wanted to read Lisa's bio because it is so awesome, and I know I can't do it justice without just reading it. It's, just, it's evident your skills in this bio alone. So I'm going to just go right into it. It says, multi-published Daphne and Carol Award winning author Lisa Carter likes to describe her romantic suspense novels as sweet tea with a slice of murder. Her latest suspense novel, The Sound of Falling Leaves, releases today, and we're going to have that information in the chat for you today, so keep an eye on for that. In addition, she writes contemporary romance with Love Inspired, the popular matchmaker series set in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. Lisa enjoys traveling and researching her next fictional adventure. When not writing, she loves spending time with family and teaching writing workshops. A native North Carolinian, she has strong opinions on barbecue and ACC basketball. In the interest of full disclosure, she also is the kind of person who licks the icing off the cupcake first, just so you know. <laughs> Welcome, Lisa, and thank you so much for joining us today. And what a great bio that is. I love it. Could you hear my voice in the bio? <laughs> I <do. laughs> Yes, yes, that is perfect on that way. And congratulations on your newest release, too. Thank that you. is great. And today's the big day, huh? It is. Well, thank you all so much for having me today. Um, and thank you for celebrating my book birthday with me. I'm, I'm usually just here alone, you know how we writers are kind of isolated, but this is fun having all of you to help me celebrate. So um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I want to present some information. And, you know, I'm a former university, high school, middle school, I've taught all the ages, teacher. And so I am probably, it's gonna make you feel like you're in the classroom again. And yes, you may wanna take notes, but I will try to allow you time to get down some important thoughts that I'd like to share with you. And what I tell um, everyone at the beginning of all my classes, I hope that this information will be a blessing to you that it will be beneficial and useful in the calling that you have that God has given you as a writer but if there's things in there that don't work for you or if maybe that doesn't fit your experience then just forget it that's okay you take what is useful to you and and you use that um, for God's glory so all right now I've told I've told everyone I'm a little shy about the technology so I'm about to hit my share screen and let's see what happens, okay? All right. I'm still doing buttons because I'm scared. Okay, and now I need to hit to make it the full screen, don't I? Is that what, what do I need? Uh, it's showing up for the most right. part, I, I think so. How do I make it do the, the whole thing, fill the whole screen? Um, Johnny and Jean, can you elaborate on that one? Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out which one it is. It's, you've got a, I think you start, hey, Rhonda, you're in the chat. Do you know what she pushes? Rhonda? Um, yes, chat. yes. Um, Lisa, start your slideshow. Go over to the slideshow tab. 
See where it says home, themes, tables, charts? Yes. Okay, click on the one that says slideshow. Okay. And from start on the far left. And it won't go faster than I want it to go, will it? It yeah. should not. It should advance when you uh, push enter. Ta-da! Hey, hey, Rhonda. I knew You're Rhonda welcome. could help us quickly. On You're that. welcome. It takes a village, y'all, a village of riders to do anything. That's so. right. This is a good community for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I knew we could call on her really quick. So thank you, Rhonda. <laughs> um, today, we want to talk about finding your writer voice. And this, when I started writing um, about 11, 12 years ago, um, seriously, I've been writing all my life, as probably most of you have. Um, but when I really started pursuing the writing career, this was a topic that there was a lot of um, confusion about. And so I kind of did a deep dive for myself. And so these are some of the things that I've run across in this 12 year journey that God has had me on. And as I said, I hope it will uh, be a blessing to you. So each story has a flow of sound like music. That's what what I, I, I compare it to. I was classically trained um, from the time I was a, a teenager, young adult. And so music has also been a big part of my life. And I think every story has a unique beat, a unique rhythm, uh, a unique tone. And writers too also have this voice um, that is recognizable throughout their entire body of work. Some singers have what I call a crystal clear tonality uh, to their voice, and it reminds me of Julie Andrews. But others have a deep, full sound, like Etta James, that reminds me of this rich Mississippi River quality. And still others, maybe your voice is like Lady Gaga, which she has a beautiful, um, very strong, what I call a Broadway kind of voice. But, you know, editors and agents look for writers with a strong or unique voice. Your writing voice is, a, is already part of you. That's the good news. It's not something that you've got to somehow manufacture or work up. It is already part of you. So what is voice? Let's start with a definition. Your voice is defined by what you have to say and how you choose to say it. When I mean, when I say that your writing voice is already a part of you, what I mean is it is the sum total of your personality and your experiences. It's your distinctive way of looking at the world. It's the indefinable essence of who you are. So your writing voice will be determined by a few factors. There are six things, and I'm gonna give you time to write them down, um, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about what I mean by each one. But your writing voice will be determined by your gender. It will be determined by the time period in which you live, which for all of us is the 21st century. It will be determined by your culture. It will be determined by your target audience. It will be determined by your area of expertise. And it will be determined by your worldview. So let me go back and give you some examples to help flesh out what I mean by these things. Um, for instance, your writing voice is determined by your gender. Tom Clancy will never be mistaken for Barbara Cartland. His voice, very uh, military thriller type novels versus Barbara Cartland, who um, is sort of the epitome of a romance writer. Um, as far as time period, Herman Melville of Moby Dick fame wrote during the 1800s. His voice was um, determined by this time period in which he grew up and he was writing and his voice will never be mistaken for Ernest Hemingway, for instance, who grew up and lived and wrote in the 20th century amidst 
the 1930s, World War II, uh, mid 20th century. Um, your writing voice will be determined by your culture. Um, this is when I think of the writings of Charles Frazier, who wrote Cold Mountain, and Maya Angelou. They are both Southern American writers, but because they come from different Southern cultures, their writing reflects that. Your target audience, J.K. Rowling's voice, is very different from Nicholas Sparks because they're writing for two different readers. Your area of expertise, um, I think of John Grisham with his legal thrillers versus Kathy Rikes, who is a forensic pathologist. Both of them really write suspense, but because of their area of expertise, their voice is influenced by that. And so you may need to stop and think, what do you know? What is it that, that um, is a part of you, a part of your background? What area are you an expert in? And then um, there's the worldview that determines your writing voice. For instance, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the great Gatsby, he had a particular worldview that was shaped by his gender, by the time period in which he grew up, by his culture, his target audience, his area of expertise, and that all combined to reflect a particular worldview that even uh, lended itself to, to the naming of an entire era, the Jazz Age, versus um, Francine Rivers, a Christian writer um, who wrote Redeeming Love. And, and her view of the world was shaped by all of those things we've previously mentioned, but again, her worldview is going to be very different than F. Scott Fitzgerald, and it's going to be the same for you. The thing about these determinations of voice is that writers reveal a great deal about themselves, more so than we realize, in the stories we feel compelled to tell, in the empathy that we have for the characters we create, in our passion for particular story themes, and the insight that we bring to character action and reaction. Here's something else um, you might want to write down. Your natural writing voice will flow and overflow out of the abundance of your individual life journey. It's only out of this what you know, plus a good dose of an innate ability to imagine that will enable you to write with honesty, conviction, and courage. Okay, I'm gonna read it again so that you have time to, to get all of it. Your natural writing voice will flow and overflow out of the abundance of your individual life journey. It is only out of this, what you know, plus a good dose of an innate ability to imagine that will enable you to write with honesty, conviction, and courage. Now we've talked about some determinations that, that can help us um, to, to see where the voice comes from and what it is. Sometimes I think it's equally helpful to say what voice is not, okay? What voice is not? It is not style. It is not technique. It's not branding. Although, understanding your voice will help you market yourself. Here is the best definition I've ever run across for what branding really is. Branding is your voice made visible. I'll say that again. Branding is your voice made visible. If you want to make a living selling your words, you have to understand you are selling yourself. You are selling your life perspective. You are selling your unique beliefs, your unique fears, your hopes, your memories, 
your passions, the honest to God real you. And that is going to require a great deal of courage because we are trained from childhood to mask our real selves, to hide behind the facade of who we think we should be. We allow the world only a small glimpse of the self that we want them to see. But writers with a strong voice have managed to overcome this fear of exposure to share their real self with gut-wrenching honesty. You have to be brave enough to put yourself on the page. And when you get beyond the false you to the real you, it's a powerful, exhilarating experience. And you have to start as a writer by giving yourself permission to say things in your own way. You don't speak or sing like anyone else. Why would you expect to write like everyone else? Literary agent Donald Moss um, has, has this quote that I think is, is worth um, looking at. He says, to set your voice free, set your words free, set your characters free, most important, set your heart free. Your voice is yourself in the story. I'll read it again. To set your voice free, set your words free, set your characters free, most important, set your heart free. Your voice is yourself in the story. So the next thing I want us to do is to list, I think maybe there's nine things that are some suggestions of how you can enhance your natural writing voice. Because remember, it's not something we've got to create, we've got to manufacture, it's already who we are. It's the sum total of our personality and our life experiences, the journey that we've been on since birth, determined by our gender and culture and time period and target audience and area of expertise and worldview. But we, it's already there, but we can do some things to enhance it, okay? So how to enhance your natural writing voice. These are going to seem a bit simplistic. I'm just going to go ahead and warn you. It's going to think, well, yeah, Lisa, uh, sure. But I promise you, these are things that you need um, to take note of, that they seem very simplistic, but it's often these things, simple things, that help that natural voice that's within you, that God put within you as a gift to share with the world that we just need to do some things to, to help it to come out and to be that strong voice that editors and agents are looking for. So number one, you need to read, you need to read a lot. You know, writers are readers first and your choice of reading material is often a good indicator of a, a writing voice that resonates with you. So some of you that are still thinking, okay, so um, what is my voice exactly? This is a really good way to maybe hone in on what your natural writing voice is by doing a lot of reading. And I'm sure you already have favorite authors that you read something by them and you think, oh yes, I just so get this. This is so me. And you continue to follow their careers and you read everything that they put out because something in their voice resonates with your voice. In their life experience resonates with you. And so it's important to read and read widely. Reading can develop your natural gift and quicken what I call the cadence of your writing. And again, that's a musical term. Um, cadence, when we're comparing it to writing, your writing cadence is this mix of narrative, description, and dialogue in your writing. And it will be unique to each person because it's your unique voice. 
Cadence is the way that you would juxtapose long paragraphs versus short paragraphs. Um, how you pepper in sensory details, your choice of POV. In other words, the cadence is the rhythm of your voice. Okay, so first suggestion to enhance your reading voice is to read a lot. Your writing voice is to read a lot. All right, number two. Again, this is going to seem kind of obvious. You need to write a lot. Your writing voice is like a muscle, and you have to exercise this muscle to fine tune and nurture the gift that lies within you. You have to write what you see, what you think, what you know. You have to allow yourself to write dreadful. Nothing you write will be wasted. All of it becomes part of developing your authentic voice, increasing your range, and gaining mastery of your, class, of your craft. Um, I told you that as a teenager, I began training, um, professional training musically, and my voice teacher, we would always start each session with these um, arpeggio type runs, and it was to, to uh, warm up my voice be before we began um, working on the pieces that we were, were cult currently working on in that phase. And it's like an athlete develops their own unique uh, warm-up exercises, warm-up routines, and these vocal exercises with my vocal teacher, my voice teacher, help deepen my musical range. Um, oftentimes, uh, my voice teacher would go really, really high up to the outer edges of my range and also go very, very low beyond deeper than my natural vocal range. And it would kind of hurt a little bit sometimes. But again, it's, it's like that athlete stretching and growing. And now, um, years later, um, I do have a very wide range musically. And it's because of those type of exercises. And it's the same thing with writing. You have to stretch yourself. You have to grow yourself. And writing is a muscle. And so you need to write. For some writers, they stretch this muscle by journaling. Um, if that's something that appeals to you, you should go for that. But remember, nothing is wasted. Um, when I was 45 years old, God sort of nudged me and said, okay, all your life, I have, I have given you this gift of writing and, and I would often as a child entertain myself, maybe you did too, with writing stories. And when I was 45, God just sort of nudged me and said, okay, what are you waiting for? When are you going to step out, take a risk and start writing the stories that I have given you? And, and that was the moment for me that I began to pursue a professional writing career. But there were lots of things previously that I had done, little things simple things that had stretched me, that had grown me in developing that voice, that writing muscle. Little things like I started off writing um, little, uh, I'm trying to think what, what the right word would be for it. I guess they were um, SAT questions. I not doesn't make me very popular with the teenage crowd, but because I have a master's in education, I, I began writing for an educational publisher. Um, I wrote questions that would be included on SAT type tests, and then eventually that led to writing textbooks. Um, I, my husband is a graphic designer, and his clients would often get me to write website copy for them or for brochures, that kind of thing. Um, as a young mom, I helped lead a mother's preschooler group in my uh, church, and I wrote newsletters for the ladies, and that crafted and helped me to fine tune um, the uh, ability to express my thoughts. I, I wrote magazine articles as time went on, and then at 45, God said, okay, it's time to to write these stories that have been swirling around in your head. And so for me, that was when I began the, the, that part of my journey. And so it's the same for you. 
Don't think that anything um, you write is wasted. It's all good practice. It's all stretching and growing that writing voice, that muscle. Um, because, you know, you have to realize that for, for the majority um, of those years, I was only writing during nap time. You know, that was the only time I had the, the, the space mentally and physically to try to do those things. So um, don't neglect the gift that is in you and, and write and exercise that muscle would be my encouragement to you. All right. The third thing is listen. You need to hone your observation skills. This is going to come in so important when you're beginning to learn and craft dialogue. Um, when people speak, tune your ear to the subtlety of what they're really saying. Find what's authentic and transfer that authenticity to your words. So listen. When you're um, in an airport waiting to pick someone up, when you're in Starbucks, when you're in church, whenever you're out in public, um, develop this habit of listening. All right, number four, discover. What is your passion? What do you love? What draws you? I think most of us grew up hearing that as a writer, we need to write what we know. And, and that is true to a certain extent, but I think what is even more important than writing what you know is something I learned from New York Times bestselling author, Virginia Cantra. She says, you need to write what you love. This is where the musicality of your voice will resound. You, have, you will make music when you find the heart of your stories. When you discover that core message, that core truth that God has given you, that only you can deliver. And when you once discover that core message, that core truth, you will deliver that story after story again and again. So don't be afraid to explore, to dream, to discover your passions. All right, number five, embrace. Find other authors who get you and the stories that your heart longs to tell. Sometimes it requires an outsider, a friend, to help us to identify our true voice. Most of us um, as writers, consciously or not, find ourselves writing book after book, and that reflects that central truism that, that is true for us, that theme as individuals. Um, I remember when my, my first book was getting ready to come out, I asked my first editor, I said, so what is it do you think that people are, are looking to get when they pick up a Lisa Carr? Carter book, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I was asking her to help me to identify my voice. And she, she gave me some, some really um, wise words. She says, I think when they pick up a Lisa Carter book, they're, they know they're going to laugh, they're going to cry, there's going to be this sense of, of family, of home, of homecoming. Um, there, there are strong male characters in your books and, and just deep, deep characterization. And another thing that I would suggest um, is to maybe if those of you that have been um, published already, you've got some stuff out there, you can look at reviews to see what readers are saying because you'll tend to find the same kind of words over and over again to describe your writing. And that is what people um, are sensing that your voice is. So this is what I would encourage you to do. But again, it needs to be someone trusted who gets you. And I think probably arising from my childhood, the broken home that I grew up in, that you will, you will see, um, just like what my first editor said, this strong sense of family, of hope, of second chance, of restoration. And that's the, the theme, the life core message that my heart, those stories that my heart wants to tell again and again. Number six, I would say release. 
Let go of the fear that holds you back from expressing your truest self. Learn to trust your voice. Authority, power, and confidence come with the repeated practice of expression. Continue to grow your voice with new experiences. Beware of complacency and stagnation. That's death to a writer. You need to be about the business of lifelong adventures. Isn't that fun for us? We always get to um, have these adventures that that fill the well. I think Jean shared, um, I think it was Jean maybe a, a few weeks ago, a few months ago on that topic about filling the well. And as a writer, it is your obligation to have new adventures. I'm giving you permission to play because it is absolutely necessary for your creativity to fill that tank, to fill that well of creativity. Number seven in ways to enhance your natural writing voice. I would suggest that when you are in the midst of writing a story, to always aim to dig deep, to deepen your characters down to their and your emotional heart. Often when I'm in the middle of writing a scene with these characters and I'll think to myself, what is the prevailing emotion of this scene? Is it sorrow? Is it anger? Is it a happily ever after? And then I try to think within myself, what is an experience that I've had in my personal life that would correspond to the same emotion when I have felt betrayed, when I have been jealous, when I have been angry, when I have felt such grief and loss. And oftentimes when you dig deep into your own heart, then that is going to help your characters be real to your reader on the page. Writing is not for the timid, okay? Um, number eight, in ways to enhance your natural writing voice, be willing to take risk. Fear can be your best friend if you're willing to embrace it and step out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, you've heard the saying that authors say, every morning um, I sit down and figuratively slit my emotional veins and bleed out all over the screen. Well, you have to be willing to do that every time every time you start to write a scene to develop a character. When I've made myself cry, I know it will make my editor cry. And I know that that will make my reader cry. My goal is to always make you laugh at some point in the book and to also make you cry. And I don't know about you, but when I send off that manuscript to my editor, I'm always waiting on tender hooks to see um, if she will like it. And, and I'm just waiting for that email to, to let me know what she thinks. And I remember a few months ago, I turned in um, another uh, Love Inspired in the True Love Matchmaker series, and I was just waiting. And finally, I got that email. And she goes, okay, right now, I'm hysterically sobbing. Oh, I just love this book. And, and then I know, yes, I have done my job as a writer. Sometimes, it's only in that brokenness that we enter those thin places um, where for a moment the veil between humanity and the divine is lifted and it's by delving into deep waters that we find and become part of where the spirit of god is at work in us and in the world and so for number nine, the final thing I would suggest for enhancing and developing your natural writing voice is to, to not be afraid of the brokenness, to, to go there, to step out, to push out into the brokenness. Um, there have been a few times in my writing career, um, I'm now on deadline for book number 27, that I have felt and felt like I was in one of those thin places where I was in, in a place of just surrender to God, to what he was trying to do, to the story he was trying to tell. And it was a story that I knew was just beyond my mere ability 
um, that I had not really come up with this, but that God had used my voice to share a message, a truth that he wanted to share. When I was writing Under, the Tur Under a Turquoise Sky that won the Carol um, in 2015, that was one of those moments where it was just like I had no idea what was going to happen each day. I would sit down at the, the computer and, and the scene would just pour out as if I was watching a, a film reel. And, and it was just, you know, those goosebump kind of things that you knew something exciting was happening. And again, when I wrote um, Beyond the Cherokee Trail, which is a split time novel based historically in the 1800s on the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the removal of the Cherokee, and then a modern contemporary suspense story that, that fit in with that. And it was almost as if the whole thing just sort of came to me, the historic part. And it was almost like I was writing maybe something that had happened to, um, it, to someone somewhere in some time. It was just so real and so tangible. And I say that to you knowing that you're not going to think I'm psychotic because you're all writers. And I feel like you probably had some experiences like that as well with this gift that God has given you to share with the world. Um, the normal ship sailed without us a long time ago. So if I was to say that anywhere else, you know, they would think, okay, she's lost it. But when you allow yourself, when you allow God to take that voice that he's given you and work these things out in you and through you and for you, you enter those thin places. And, it, and it's, it's just an experience that, um, that I just pray for you in your writing career. Um, I want to close with um, one more thing, um, suggestion, pushing out into the deep. It comes from Luke chapter five, verse four. And when Jesus finished teaching, he said to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. And that story from the Bible, tells me as a writer that I need to be willing to go deep. I need to get outside of my comfort zone. I need to push out in my intake of God's word. I need to push out in my giving of myself. I need to push out in my going. I need to push out in prayer. I need to push out in faith. And if we are willing as writers to push out into the deep, God will bring a tremendous blessing. If you read the rest of this story, this passage in Luke 5, you will see that eventually their nets were full of fish. In fact, they had to call in reinforcements to harvest all the fish that day. They were, there were so many fish that the boats began to sink. This rich harvest was only possible because these men followed the words of Jesus. He told them to let down their nets. Of course, first, like us, they had to explain to Jesus that they'd been fishing all night long already. Kind of sounds like us trying to explain to God things he already knows. But finally, Simon responded with, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when called to push out into deep waters of writing, our responses must not include excuses. Instead, our response must be, Jesus, at your command, we follow. If you are willing to get out into deep waters with God, he will meet you in a spectacular way. And when you find yourself on the edge of your seat while writing, your heart is thumping, your hands are shaking, You've probably just written something that will be worth reading. Don't allow fear to stop you. Don't be afraid to confront your personal barriers to truth in voice. The next time you read something that moves you, realize that writer moved beyond her own fears and wrote those words anyway. Now go and do likewise.
Thank you again so much, everyone, for allowing me to celebrate my book birthday with you. Oh, Lisa, that was absolutely wonderful. And I know we probably have some people with some questions and stuff, but before we invite everybody back in, talk, talk to us about your new book. All right. Um, the Sound of Falling Leaves came out today. It is romantic suspense set in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina. Um, there is a, a opera singer who has been through a traumatic experience. She comes to Appalachia, her aunt's apple orchard, because her aunt, her great aunt, has fallen and is hurt and it's harvest season so it's set in the autumn with all the beautiful leaves of the Blue Ridge and there she she finds this mysterious orchard caretaker that her aunt has hired and she's immediately concerned that he is taking advantage of her injured elderly aunt and she's on the defensive um, she is writing a dissertation on a musicology type project um, on Appalachian ballads. And so throughout the writing of this book, I listened to a lot of Appalachian ballads. And there is something just so beautiful about these ballads. It, it captures the beauty, the joy. And yet also there is such a dark, dark melancholy um, sense to a lot of these ballads that I think reflects the human heart as well as this place, Appalachia. Um, it is, it's almost sublime, some of these songs. You see the mist covering the mountains and you can almost hear the bagpipes whirling because most of these areas were settled by the Scots-Irish people groups. And the whole thing is she comes across a, a woman who sang decades ago um, and it's sort of a cold case of a missing person and she becomes involved in that. But what she doesn't realize is that in trying to learn the fate of this woman who was a singer like herself with which she identifies so closely, there are forces at work um, that are trying to keep the past buried where they want it to stay. Um, and then Zeke, her name is Tessa, Zeke is the orchard caretaker and there's just a lot of mystery. He's on a quest as well and they, sparks fly from the moment they meet. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of conflict between them, but they will find themselves having to work together to survive um, uh, some of the forces that come against them. Um, it's, a, it's a whole thing about, um, they've both experienced loss, and it's based on a true life cold case that happened 50 years ago in this region that I began reading about it. And then I fictionalized the characters and the immediate setting. But um, they, they discover um, within each other what they need um, to each of them answer the questions that their heart is asking. There's this sense of, and it's a Welsh word called hiraith, and we don't have the equivalent word in English, but because both of them have been faced with loss, great grief and sorrow that they're struggling, that they're wrestling with, um, they're asking this question, is this all there is, death and loss? Um, is, is there anything beyond this, beyond death? And that is what Hiraith is, is this sense of longing, nostalgia for a place that we've never been. And as a Christian, for me, that is that longing for what is beyond us, for God, for heaven, for that kind of glory. And um, I hope I'm not painting it as a very dark book, although the cold case um, it, it's a, a real life thing. It was very hard, um, but there is such beauty in this place. There is such beauty in the music, which my background comes out in that. And I, I hope in the end that readers will find it haunting in the sense that they will continue to think about these characters and their journey mm -hmm. to home. And I'm going to cry again, but... I think that's really what this book is about. Wow. Home. Oh, it is. The fullest sense of the word and what that means. Um, so, hmm. reviews oh, no, so far, people have really, really 
I think, been able to, to get that sense that I was hoping to capture. And as a writer, you don't ever know if you've been successful with that or not. But um, it's not an easy book. It's, it's, there are dark places because of this. Um, there, are, there are modern day murders that are going on that tie into um, the historic disappearance. But uh, I think it's, it's a life affirming book. And uh, I had a great time researching it. Oh my God. I would love to be able sometime to share with everybody yeah. some of the fun things that the God moments that God always directs me. And it's just incredible how he'll lead me to just the very uh, person I need to talk to or the, mm -hmm. the church um, uh, avenue that I need to go down. And so it, it was another one of those books that there were thin places in that book that I felt when I was in the writing of it. So I'm sorry for crying. I cry all the time. No, no, no. <laughs> and I'm just really hoping that people listened to how you described the evolution of this book because that that was inspirational. And you could hear your voice in it. You talked about the setting, the uh, character's quest, the character's journey, uh, it just everything that kind of Johnny jump in on that all the all the uh, factors of fiction wasn't it in there and just her ex her synopsis of that yeah it was really great hearing the story and I and I just mm -hmm. I just love the research that went into it and, and you're talking about the history of it and all that that's wonderful and I based on a true incident yeah, that she then yeah. fictionalizes it oh my gosh I think we, we all want to read it so yeah. <laughs> From looking at the chat, yes, I think everybody wants to read this book. <laughs> yeah, right, right, and it's just um, you've been you've been a blessing to us today, and inspirational and challenging, and I love how you make voice doable. I mean, that encourages us, you know, to step out of that, and the whole musicality of voice, the word cadence. I just, I, I love that interpretation. I don't know if you want to speak any more about the music side of our voice. I don't know that I have anything else to okay. say. Okay, it's all right. I just <laughs> love it. I, I love it that just that it, it feeds the creative person inside me on that way. And great examples that you give of specific authors on, the, on that way. We've got about 10 minutes left. Why don't we, can you close out your screen share? Okay. You know how to do that up at the? Not really, no, maybe. Yeah, you're getting there. There you got it. Perfect. Yeah. And, perfect. And we'll invite people to come on back. Johnny, do you have a question? As people come back in, do you have something that you want to ask right oh, off? Yes. I was so blown away and I just took all kinds of notes on everything. Um, and maybe, and you may have touched on this a little bit, like I write over multiple genres. So, you know, I've written very lighthearted things, very deep themed things. And so I feel like my voice is not always the same, but I love what you said that, yes, the voice is the same, just expressed in different ways. So maybe if you could talk maybe just briefly about the difference between voice and tone, because I think that's what the difference is. There's that lighthearted tone, and then there's that very deep emotional, dig down deep tone. Um, I think you're right. I think it is the same voice. But the way you're, you're expressing that voice will be a little different in the different genres. For instance, I write for Love Inspired as well. I write contemporary romance, which um, is much more lighthearted, fun. And yet, I think the key elements of what you find in my suspense, you also find in my my just contemporary romance series. I have uh, this True Love Matchmaker book coming out November 1st, another one of those. And I have, I tend to have the same readers for both. Um, now, some people don't like the suspense because it is a little more edgy because I, I do with a little more real situations um, that are very fleshed out. But those elements of laughter of the romantic tension, which would be whether it was contemporary 
romance or suspense with the, the heart, the home, the strong family, the strong characters. Um, I, one of the greatest compliments I ever received was from a man, a male reader, which surprises me. Mm. I have Marines who read my true love matchmaker series. They love them. They can't wait to get the next one. They take them off their wife's nightstand and she's trying to finish the book and they've taken it. And, and I get, you know, male readers, um, when I have these suspense books, naturally you would think that. But I had one male reader tell me one time early on in my career, he says, you write men the way they really are, not the way women would like them to be. And so you get that no matter what genre I'm writing in. My tone is going to be a little more heavy handed in the suspense, less heavy handed in the contemporary romance because my aim is to really have you laughing and it's just a lot of fun and there's a lot of chemistry which you've got a lot of chemistry in the suspense but in a different way but in the end that happily ever after i think those key elements that make a lisa carter book or a johnny alexander book are going to be the same and i think the four novellas that i, I wrote uh, many years ago, you're going to find that in those too. So I think your voice transcends whatever the genre is because it's you that you're putting on the page. That's a good point. Can you give us any tips on in putting in the humor into our I, writing? I think it's part of your natural voice or it's not. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You will find yourself putting that in, whether you mean to or not, that's just the way you look at the world. Even kind of when I'm doing the suspense book, sometimes it's a gallows humor, if you know what that is, but it's still, it's there and it makes you laugh. You think, I really shouldn't laugh, but I am gonna laugh because it's just funny. And, and some people can do it and some cannot. Now, if you've got it there, you can continue to strengthen that and enhance that. And I would say by reading a lot of people who have that same touch in their voice. Um, but if you are not a humorous person, then I would say don't try. Don't try to put that because it, it comes across as natural or it doesn't. Wow. Wow. Other questions? I can think of one more I've got, but I, I don't want to squelch everybody else. Anybody else want to jump in with another question? Not a question, but a, a, maybe a bit of an observation. Elaine talked early on in the chat um, about a ghost writing <clears throat> and trying to match someone else's voice. So maybe we could just yeah. talk on that briefly for a moment. I have never done any ghost writing. So I don't really know a lot about that. Um, I know that some writers tell me that they can't read other books during certain stages of the writing process. And that's an individual thing that you will have to determine for yourself. Um, I, I do a lot of reading before I start the writing process. It's part of my research. I will do some reading during the writing and then of course, afterwards, when I'm in the editing stage, I jump really, really heavy back into the reading again. So you have to determine what works best for you um, because you don't want to plagiarize anyone. Yeah. But at the same time, you can be reading something, but if you're allowing what you've read to flow out of your own voice, it shouldn't come across the same as another writer, which is why sometimes we can end up with two books releasing at the same time with the same basic story scenario. And yet they will both be very different books because those writers' voices are very different. So wow. I don't, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has anything to say about ghost writing um, to answer that, but that would be my take on it. Elaine, I don't know if you've got something to add to that. Well, I just, I just uh, find it intriguing and I love I never knew I would do any ghostwriting, but I, this is the second book I'm doing right now. And in both cases, the authors uh, sent me a lot in print. And so I caught their voice, if that's the right way to say it. And um, I got one of the best compliments ever from uh, someone who uh, I had, a writer who had read the first 
first ghostwriting book that came out last December and said to that to the author said how did somebody else write this for you but it's you speaking to me and I thought that was the most uh, the nicest compliment I could get and I think that's a, a real gift voice, not mine yep I think that's a real gift I think so too and Johnny do you want to share what Bethany says that 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 Oh, she can't right now, but you may have seen it in the draft that Bethany had added your first draft is half you and half the person you're ghostwriting for. And then the second draft is erasing your voice entirely. That's a, that's, a, good. It, that's good. It, good. So that you got to have some self-knowledge on that. You got to know, you got to know your own voice, which is what Lisa's kind of helped us with. I will say uh, quickly, I had a professor in college uh, in our, in our writing composition class who made us read like Hemingway, and then turn in five pages written in his voice. Oh. And what an interesting, I, I still remember that, and it's been ooh, decades uh, ago, you know, write in, uh, read Jane Austen and write in her voice. And you start to find out then what feels natural to you. If you force yourself into a different voice, um, you start to understand then who you are as a writer, and that was his point entirely. And uh, I, I really appreciated that exercise, so I'll just um, suggest that. That's great. It also Fine. strengthens your own voice to write in another's voice. I think it strengthens, it makes you think, so. That's great, great points, great tips coming from writers. I love it, I love it that way. Lisa, we're, we're almost out of time, and I know I want to talk about next week, too, but did I see you had a Christmas book coming out? I do. November Let's 1st. Let's talk real Christmas quick about book. that one. Yeah. Um, that, is, that was so fun. I had such a good time researching weddings. Um, it's a, a girl who gets an invite to be the maid of honor at her friend's wedding. The friend, however, is marrying a former boyfriend and she feels like such a loser because she got to go to this wedding with all of her college friends and everybody's gonna be a couple and she's all alone. Yeah. And so she wakes up one morning and there's a bang on the roof and she goes out and realizes that her father has hired a painter. She's living in her grandmother's house that she's inherited. And so she's wanting to sell the house and, and she's a, an artist and she's a very creative bohemian type of person, kind of a little ditzy. And she realizes as these legs come down the ladder and she's looking up on the porch that the legs belong to her high school heartthrob crush the boy that everybody in town star quarterback nicest guy in the world most handsome heart thumping knee knocking guy you would ever want to meet in your life he is climbing down the ladder from the roof of her house and he owns a painting company now and so he you know they they become friends as he is and she was always the shy clumsy, klutzy girl who was always scared in high school to say anything. Doesn't even think he knows her name, but he does know her name because she's so gifted artistically. And so they become friends. He's a single parent. She finds out she is actually teaching his, his little daughter. And she is so desperate to go to this wedding that just out of the blue, she asks him to be her plus one. Mm -hmm. And that's all it's going to be. We're not going to pretend to be boyfriend and girlfriend. You're just going to be my plus one. But what happens is because it's a true love matchmaker thing, they get to the wedding, which is in this big resort type thing. And of course the matchmakers find out and before they can even make it back to town, the word is spread. Not only are they boyfriend and girlfriend, suddenly they're engaged. And she doesn't want to lie, but everybody thinks they're engaged. It's Christmas time. And so, you know, that's the scenario of oh. how they work that out. And of course, you know, there, there's got to be a happily ever after. But it was a lot of fun writing her, her voice. Um, if you've ever been the shy, klutzy, maybe bookworm kind of girl like me who, you know, this is a dream come true that Prince Charming is actually taking you on a date kind of thing. Um, but like the Hallmark I, movie. I could already see it as a Hallmark movie. It just what, beautiful. I, what I didn't realize at the time when I wrote this a year ago was that my youngest daughter just got engaged three weeks ago. And so all of this research that I did on the wedding 
um, traditions and everything is going to come in really handy as we start to plan her wedding. So that's been kind of fun. Well, and he proposed on top of a mountain in the Blue Ridge. So, you know, it all, all kind of fits together. <laughs> I love it. Well, congratulations on an upcoming wedding and two new books being birthed. Thank you. In a couple, couple weeks. That is super. This has been inspirational. Absolutely inspirational on that. And so real quick while we're still recording next week is our own Elaine McAllister, right Elaine? You're going to talk about generational storytelling. Is that correct? That's right. I hate to follow Lisa. You guys have uh, heard the best. Now you'll hear the week no. of Oh, no, no, no. Each week is so different on this group. <laughs> I love it. But always inspirational. Johnny, do you have any last minute thing to add? Okay. Other than you, you, you look great with your hair cut like that. We love it. We love it. Uh, the stuff, uh, what we usually do, Lisa, is we'll finish up the recording and then we stay on for a few minutes afterwards for our after party. So we invite you guys all to stay over and uh, thank you for taking the time for being here today but it's been very encouraging lisa this has been delightful thank you thank you for having me and uh see you all next week and thank you if those of you that have taken the time to watch the replay we always want to include you in our community in our group and uh, such a good group this way so thank you everybody bye now